Hi, I'm Simon. I help happy staff deliver better things sooner. You can find me at curiouscoffee.club. There's a QR code there if you're lazy like me. Most of all, thank you for having me. To Michael, to the organizers of 90 Days of DevOps, and to you for listening. Uh, I want to talk about cracking cholera's code. Hundreds of thousands of people died from cholera in the 1800s, and cholera still affects us today. All of this furthers my desire to share what we can learn from cholera, and particularly from one man's efforts to overcome the disease. And that was John Snow, a Victorian physician in London. Um, three things I'd like to share with you. The first thing is I want to talk about, I want to start at Victorian times to show a tragic example of how beliefs can let us down. Then I want to talk about what we can do about it. And finally, I want to bring technology into the picture because this is a DevOps conference. Um, all good ideas in this presentation come from other people, including my father, Nigel, mentor Noah, and these other amazing people, including John Snow himself. And all bad ideas are mine and mine only. There's going to be a few deviations away from real history, purely because there's only so much I can fit in. The nuances I'm going to leave out, and those nuances are important. But I'll do it the best I can in the time I have. And secondly, I'm going to ask questions as I go. Normally this would be interactive, and those questions would help make sure I'm conveying the material in a way that makes sense. Uh, I don't have that right now, but those questions are still important because it creates space in your mind for what I'm going to share with you after that question. So hopefully still useful, we'll find out. So let's go to the first bit, which is beliefs and how they let us down. So if you imagine, just to set the scene, we're in 1854 London, it's the beginning of the third outbreak. Over 100,000 people in the UK have died from cholera thus far. The prevalent belief of the time of scientists and the general populace is that cholera is spread by inhaling bad smell. It's called the miasma theory. Um, and London and many cesspools are therefore suspected. This was before London's sewer system had been established. London primarily featured uh, many standalone cesspools that were emptied each night by uh, by nightmen, as you see in that picture, who then sell that effluent to farmers for use as fertilizer. So let's put you in the picture. So cholera is exploding in Soho, London. You are the budget holder, uh, budget holder for the region or the vestry, uh, and local officials are presenting you with three options. And these three options are all being considered because they can remove the source of bad smells. And remember that miasma theory, the common belief of the time, is that if we eliminate the sources of bad smell, then no one can catch cholera because cholera is caught by inhaling bad smells. So the first option to remove the source of bad smells is by to close smelly businesses such as slaughterhouses, tanneries. The second option they're presenting you to remove the source of bad smells is emptying all the cesspools into the Thames. And the third option they're presenting you to remove the source of bad smells is to knock down buildings to improve airflow on narrow streets. <clears throat> the question I have for you is, which option would you try? And whilst you consider that for a few seconds, I'm going to have a sip of water and then we'll move on. <clears throat> curious which one you've chosen, but the one I'm going to walk you through is, is the second option. So all these three options were considered but the second option is most interesting to me because they actually tried it. And so I can actually show you what happened. So let's talk about emptying cesspools into the Thames. And um, I want to show you how that played out through the eyes of people at the time. And the way I'm going to do that is through a cause and effect diagram or a current reality tree from the theory of constraints. And the reason I love this is it's really dead simple. Um, there's only two things to note about a current reality tree or a cause and effect diagram, and that is an arrow is an if-then cause, if-then clause, sorry. So if the lamp is not plugged in, then the lamp will not turn on. An arrow means if-then. And secondly, a circle is an and clause. So if it is not raining and if I'm outside, then I will get wet. So that's how you read the diagram, but I'm going to narrate you through it, don't worry. So if you look around London in 1854, these are the observations you'd have. You'd notice that cesspools are overflowing, bad smelling sewage is exposed, and outbreaks of cholera are sudden and widespread. And even if you just stare at these three things for a very short amount of time, you can start to see some cause and effect relationships. If cesspools are overflowing, that's probably one reason why bad smelling sewage is exposed. Um, there's something else of importance in 1854, which is loads of, uh, the London's population had exploded. Loads of people were migrating to London from the countryside. And the second thing was London was continuing to rely on cesspools. The, the, the 
building of the uh, sewer system was underway but not complete. And those two things together, if London's population has exploded and London continues to rely on cesspools, that was why London cesspools were overflow. Also, as we've said, the common belief at the time, miasma theory, was that cholera spreads by bad smells. And if that was the case, if that's what people believed, and bad smelling sewage was exposed, people are going to get scared. People are going to suddenly go, hey, that's why we need to empty cesspools into the Thames, because we don't want bad smelling sewage to be exposed, because cholera spreads by bad smells. So that's why they chose that option. But also, if cholera spreads by bad smells, and bad smells alone, then by default, all water is considered safe to drink. Also, if Thames is the cheapest source of water and all water is safe to drink, then water companies will source that drinking water from the Thames. Also, if all water is safe to drink, then water companies will not filter any water they take in for distributing for drinking. And it's these three things that scare me. So if cesspools are emptied into the Thames and water companies source water from the Thames to drink and they don't filter the water, it leads to this, and Arthur Hill Hassel puts it so well. He says, It is beyond dispute that a portion of the inhabitants of the metropolis are made to consume, in some form or another, a portion of their own excrement, and moreover, to pay for the privilege. People are drinking their own effluent. So the question I have for you is, what happened next? What do you think? Well, if we follow this through based on the belief of the time that cholera is spread by bad smell and bad smell alone, then everything should be fine. It doesn't matter if people are drinking effluent because cholera only spreads by bad smells. But what actually happened, there was a, this is where reality deviated from expectations. Water companies were actually spreading infected material in drinking water. And so that's why outbreaks were sudden and widespread. And that's why there was a pressure on the government to act. But the problem is, was that the pressure to act meant they did more of the thing that they should not have done at all. They emptied the cesspools into the Thames faster. This created a downward spiral. Um, so the question I have for you is, why didn't things go as they expected? Why did reality deviate from expectations? Deming says, theory leads to prediction. And in this case, their theory, on the left-hand side, a cholera spreads fire bad smells, the miasma theory, was wrong. So their predictions of their actions are wrong. Their belief that cholera spreads via bad smells, the miasma theory is wrong, and this led to the wrong predictions and therefore the wrong actions. So, to try and summarize that bit. Beliefs drive behaviors. So the belief of the time was that cholera spreads via bad smells. That was dubbed the miasma theory. And that led to the behaviors of cesspools being emptied upstream, water companies sourcing unfiltered downstream water, because it was seen as safe. The question I have for you is, what happens if you try to behaviors, try to change behaviors directly? Have you ever told a child not to do something? What was the very next thing that that child did? I don't know about you, but if that child was me, I would do exactly what you told me not to do. And, and Alfie Cohen puts it really well. He says, what rewards and punishment do is produce temporary compliance, they bias obedience. If you try and change behavior directly, you, you have at best a temporary change in behavior. Um, and it's for that reason that a change in belief must come before we see any real long lasting change in behaviors, that it took over 30 years to see any real positive change in London's approach to preventing cholera. We need to change the beliefs before we can change the behaviors. So recap, cause and effect thinking can help us find the belief that undermined previous attempts to improve a situation. In this case, the belief that people could only catch cholera by inhaling bad smells led to 1815's London doing all the wrong things in an attempt to improve the situation, emptying cesspools into the tent. Um, and understand what we need to do differently next time. Don't empty cesspools into the Thames. But most of all, beliefs must change before behaviors will change. If people still believe in the miasma theory, they'll still operate in accordance with the miasma theory. They'll continue to just worry about inhaling bad smells. The question I have for you, but one for the back of your head, 
is how would you prove the miasma theory is wrong? So if you were conversing with scientists of the time, how would you prove to them that the miasma theory is wrong? I just want to plant that as a seed, and I'll come back to this in a second. Well, in about five minutes. So interval. I want to talk about my friend Sheila. So my friend Sheila was experiencing three symptoms. This was a few months ago. She was feeling tired, she was having dry eyes, and she was feeling forgetful. And her belief was that she was using the computer too much, and that was leading to all these three symptoms. Um, so her solution, uh, she thought she'd just be okay if she used computers less. That would remove all three symptoms. But how can we tell if Sheila's belief is correct? How can we tell that all her symptoms were indeed caused by using computers too much? We can actually, I mean, some of the answers I, I generally hear at this stage are try and see, uh, run an experiment, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But for me, we could actually um, answer the question with just a piece of paper and a pencil. We, that's the cheapest way of doing it as well. We, let's not try and set up a clinical trial. Um, so Sheila believed that using the computer too much was causing all three symptoms. The interesting thing is, if she is right, we should be able to connect the belief with each of the three symptoms using a cause and effect uh, arrows like we did before. So let's, let's do this. So if Sheila uses the computer too much and Sheila blinks less when looking at screens, then that would explain why she has dry eyes. So Sheila's belief of using the computer too much is, is perhaps a valid cause of the dry eyes because we can see how one would cause the other, how the underlying belief would lead to the symptoms. But Sheila couldn't explain how using the computer too much would lead to her forgetfulness. There was a missing because. If Sheila uses the computer too much, she would feel forgetful because... And she didn't have an answer to that. And there's another missing because. If Sheila uses the computer too much, she would feel tired because... And again, Sheila didn't have an answer. And Lisa Sheinkoff says that people are hurt and organizations do not improve due to our carelessness in the use of the word because. And that's what just, just what Sheila had done. Sheila's belief was wrong because it could not account for two of her symptoms, tiredness and forgetfulness, two missing becauses. Um, so Sheila's solution, uh, at best, maybe alleviate her dry eyes a little bit, but it wouldn't help with the other two symptoms. Um, and Russell Aikoff fits this really well. He says, we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. And Sheila's solution was, the right solution, but it was to the wrong problem. If using the computer too much had caused all three symptoms, then using the computer less would have been the right solution. But we could see that using the computer too much was not the real reason, as it could not explain all three symptoms. So Sheila actually went to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, that's interesting, I think you have an underactive thyroid. And if you have an underactive thyroid, that would lead, lead to reduced thyroxine hormone in your blood which would mean a slow metabolism, which would lead to these three things I can't even pronounce, which would then lead to the three symptoms that Sheila was facing. Um, and the great thing is, is then if Sheila took thyroxine hormone, uh, that would balance the metabolism and all these symptoms would dissolve. Um, so recap, valid beliefs should explain all symptoms observations. Now, Sheila's belief using the computer too much could not explain her tiredness or forgetfulness. There were two missing causes. It was an invalid belief. Whereas the, slew, the, whereas the doctor's belief that Sheila had an underactive thyroid could explain all symptoms. It doesn't mean that his diagnosis uh, or belief was correct, but at the very least it's valid. Um, and an invalid belief is likely to mobilize unhelpful behavior. Sheila's incorrect belief led her from abstaining from using the computer. Did that help? No. She just missed the computer. <laughs> right, so let's move on to the second bit, upgrading faulty beliefs. So I asked you a question, which was, how would you prove to scientists of the time that the miasma theory was wrong? Uh, let me give you a little bit more information to help. So John Snow, the scientist of the time, an eminent uh, uh, person that we're talking about here, the uh, protagonist, that's what I'm saying, uh, the protagonist of the time noticed three interesting things about outbreaks. Um, in, 18, in 1800s. The first thing was he noticed that outbreaks were sudden and widespread. So this is a diagram of Soho, all the red circles here are deaths, 
you notice they're all in and around the same area and they occurred within a within a 24 hour all these deaths have occurred sudden widespread across the, across the whole of Suffolk. Secondly, he noticed that there was a, two deaths far, far away from this main outbreak area, one in Hampstead, one in, in Islington. And so he noticed that some people, his second observation were, was that some people are affected far from the outbreak. Um, and also he noticed two things. There. He noticed that the Poland Street workhouse in Blue there had very few deaths. Five out of 535 workers died, compared to 616 in the surrounding area. So a very small portion. But even more so, this uh, lime brew right in the middle there had no deaths. It was right in the epicenter. And so his third, John Snow's third observation was that some people in outbreak areas were completely unaffected. So these were his observations. And the common belief of the time was that cholera is spread by a bad smell. And the question becomes, can we connect that underlying belief to the observations using cause and effect logic? Or would there be missing the causes, indicating that the belief is invalid? Um, so let's try. So cholera is spread by a bad smell. If that is the case and bad smell affects large areas, that would explain why the outbreaks are sudden and widespread, why the whole of cholera Sorry, the whole of Soho came down with cold in a very short period. Maybe there was a bad smell throughout Soho. So the, the miasma theory would explain that. Um, and that's what was leading to those three options of emptying cesspools into the Thames, knocking down buildings to improve airflow, close smelly businesses. Though so that was where those ideas came from. Um, but there were two missing causes. The miasma theory could not explain why some people were affected far from the outbreak. People up in the north in Hampstead. Otherwise, it isn't. And it couldn't explain why the Poland Street workhouse and the Lion Brew were largely unaffected. If they were in the epicenter of this bad smell, why were they not infected by cholera? The Sudomizer theory could not explain two observations. So, what was John Snow's belief? John Snow's belief was that cholera was not spread through inhaling bad smell, but instead spread through ingesting infected material. The way he words it is, cholera is communicated by the evacuations for the elementary town. Um, so, so John Snow, Snow then went through a systematic way of testing his belief, his theory. Now, let's do that in the paper today. So if cholera spreads by, by ingesting infected material and water companies are spreading infected material and drinking water, then outbreaks are sudden and widespread. Water companies are, are spreading or pumping infected material directly to houses from the Thames. So it would explain that. But also cholera spreads by ingesting infected material and water can be transported through in food and also in bottles. That would also explain why some people were affected far from the outbreak area in Islington and Hampstead. And the reason for this was a young niece or an auntie really liked the taste of water from one of the pumps in Soho. So her niece took the water from the Soho pump, transported it all the way to I think Islington drank it, and she went back to Hampstead, and they both died that evening. Also, if cholera spreads by, by ingesting infected material, and some buildings have their own water sources, then some people in the outbreak areas are unaffected. So the Poland Street Workhouse and the Lion Brewery, well, the Poland Street Workhouse had its own well, its isolated well, that wasn't affected, a safe source of water. Whereas the, and the Lion Brewery, they mostly just drank alcohol during the day. So they were absolutely fine. So what solution do you think John Snow recommended? In comparison to knocking down buildings to improve airflow, in comparison to emptying cesspools into the Thames, in comparison to closing down smelly businesses? Boil your water. Dead simple. These heavy-handed approaches of, of uh, knocking down buildings, emptying cesspools, could all have just been swapped by asking people to boil water if the underlying theory uh, if they'd understood the underlying, the correct underlying theory. As uh, so a recap, recap. So valid beliefs should explain all symptoms or observations. In this case, the, the miasma theory could not explain why people were affected far from the outbreak or why some people in outbreak areas were unaffected. An invalid belief is likely to mobilize unhelpful behavior, as we talked about with Shiva, not using the computer. But in this case, 
they were considering knocking down buildings, so they emptied all the cesspools into the Thames, and that just made things worse, closing down smelly businesses. All these would be unhelpful behaviours. Right, so let's jump into the final bit, which is the role of technology. What does this mean for us today? Let's come back to the present and apply what we've learned to a modern business. And again, let's put you in the middle of this. So let's imagine you're a principal technology consultant and your client wants you to build an internal travel booking website. Um, this will replace a manual process, making it easier for staff to submit travel requests to a central admin team who will then approve and book it. Your client believes it will solve three problems. Uh, staff are spending loads of time submitting travel requests. Those requests are taking ages to be reviewed and approved, and costs across the organization are increasing. The question I have for you, whilst I have a sip of water, is would you take on this project? If you were the principal technology consultant and your client said, this is what I want you to do for this reason. So, and it pays well, it pays well. So maybe, maybe, maybe you would, maybe I would. Uh, let's play that. Let's do it again, another cause and effect diagram. So these are the observations that I mentioned, the problems that the, the client wanted to remove, costs increasing, the staff spending loads of time submitting travel requests, and then the central admin team spending loads of time reviewing those requests. There's one other, uh, two other observations I didn't mention, which was that staff were unhappy and tired across the organization, excuse me, and staff were also quitting. Um, so one other piece of note in the top right over here <laughs> uh, is that travel was a significant cost across this consultancy, across this organization. So if costs were increasing and travel was a significant cost, then the leaders of this or your client's organization were focusing on reducing travel costs. So it was, the, it was the biggest cost that they could reduce if they looked at it in a pie chart, right? Um, also, some staff have wasted company money in the history. A very small number of staff compared to how many there are, but some staff have wasted company money. And that meant, in general, the staff aren't trusted by leadership. And if staff aren't really trusted by leadership and leaders are trying to focus on reducing travel costs, that's why they introduced the idea that all travel requests must be approved to make sure that we save every penny we can, no wasted money. And if that is the case, and reviewing travel requests will take time, then what they did in this organization was they actually set up a central admin team to review each request, because it takes time. The existing managers wouldn't have the time to do that. But the central admin team, we need to pay their wages. So just forming a central admin team who can dedicate their time to reviewing requests is going to increase costs in the organization because we pay their salaries. Also, the central admin team has limited context. If for those travel requests coming to them, they don't know the people who submitted them, they don't know why they're traveling, uh, there's only so much they can grasp from a travel request. And what that meant was if the central admin team was formed to review requests and they have limited context because they don't know the people, they don't know why they're traveling, they can only review the requests, the travel requests, based on cost alone. What is the final figure? And what that meant was that many travel requests were very valid for, for a very good reason and were exceeding a certain amount, which meant they were just rejected. And that meant staff had to keep kind of uh, uh, resubmitting those travel requests with additional justification. So that's why staff were spending so long trying to submit travel requests. Um, but also, if cheap hotels are generally the ones outside of town and requests are reviewed on cost alone, then staff are going to have to choose those hotels that are, out of, that are outside of town when they're traveling just to get their travel request approved. And then when they get there, they're gonna to have to spend loads of time commuting between their hotel outside of town and wherever their venue is. And also if cheap flights are the ones that are at inconvenient hours, and those are the ones that will generally be approved because they're the cheapest, then staff are going to have to choose those inconvenient travel, uh, inconvenient flights, travel outside of hours, inconvenient hours. And those two reasons, the fact that they're having staff having to spend loads of time commuting when they get to their destination and they're having to travel in inconvenient hours mean that staff are unhappy and tired. And I can tell you, <laughs> unhappy and tired staff are less productive. And the funny thing is, staff are traveling for very, you know, to be with their colleagues or be with clients. And if they're doing that when they're tired in their, the, in their worst form, they're going to make bad decisions. 
they're going to be less productive. And, and that is going to mean that costs very indirectly, but surely will increase because they can't do justice to uh, their workshop or whatever the, whatever the reason is that they've traveled. But also if staff are unhappy and tired, at some point staff are going to quit. And if staff are quitting and replacing staff comes at a cost, again, costs are increasing for another reason. So the question, the, the question I ask at this stage is what one box on this diagram, if you could only change one box, you could wave a magic wand at one box in this diagram to help this, this really sad tale pay, play out differently, which box on this diagram would it be? And at the end, I'll give you a second to think about that. Let's have another sip of water. We're almost there. So I, I, I generally hear a few things. I normally say, well, um, what do I normally hear? I normally hear that uh, our, uh, I think, uh, well, actually, I don't remember, but generally boxes in the top left are chosen. Um, so I, th I th but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this one, um, that staff are not trusted. And the question I have is, what happens, what would happen to this diagram, to this story, this sad story, if we instead trusted staff? And Reed Hastings says at Netflix, you don't have to complete a purchase order and wait for approval to buy something. You just do it. And it's not that what you there's no record of what you've done. It's tracked and it can be validated later on, it can be checked later on. It's just that you can just go ahead and do it. And there will always be people that cheat, but the gains outweigh the losses. So I'm, I'm going to apply that mentality. If we hired our staff, then by default, let's trust them and let's see how that plays out. So if we instead of, if we flip this box and say staff are trusted, then the interesting thing is that if we trust our staff, then we need to approve their travel requests. We can assume they're doing the right thing. And that means that if we assume they're doing the right thing, we don't need a central admin team to check every travel request. And if we don't need a central admin team, Everything that follows was a side effect of having a central admin team who don't have a context, who can approve travel based on cost and cost alone, meaning that people have to travel in convenient times, stay outside of town. All of those side effects disappear. And we also need to, don't need to pay the salaries of a central admin team. So actually costs reduce. <laughs> um, and if costs are reducing, then the whole need to focus on reducing costs and reducing travel costs in particular is no longer there. So we don't need to approve travel requests for a second reason and that costs in our business are going down as well as staff are trusted. That we believe they'll do the right thing for the business. So we create a reinforcing loop, a virtuous cycle. So what, now I ask you this question again, uh, what benefit would creating a travel booking website have offered? I asked this indirectly before. I asked if you'd pick up the work, but now I'm going to ask you directly. What benefit would creating a travel booking website have offered, given what I've told you now? You probably guessed my, my response, which is, uh, these these are the problems, right? It's just to remind you, uh, we can't ask that question without reminding ourselves of the problem that the, clients, the client wanted to resolve. Would it have reduce the time spent by the admin team, by the staff? Would it help to reduce cost costs? No, as Peter Drucker may have said, there's nothing worse than doing the wrong thing well. It may have had some minor benefits, or more than anything, it spent lots of money doing the wrong thing. Right, so technology solidifies processes. So if we imagine, in this case, the technology was an internal travel booking website for staff. Uh, your client wants you to build an internal travel booking website to solidify the existing process of a centralized approval process for all staff. Um, and that process existed to reinforce the behavior that all travel costs must be approved. And that behavior was driven by the belief that staff cannot be trusted. So you were coming in at the top there saying, you know, you're being asked to implement a travel booking website to reinforce the process uh, that was already in place, that was being done manually centralized approval process by that centralized admin team to reinforce the behavior all travel costs must be approved and all, all of this existed because staff cannot be trusted with the underlying belief 
And what we did was we saw that if we flipped that belief, something marvelous happened, right? But before we go there, the great thing is as we add these layers, as we uh, add process and then bring in technology, uh, in particular when we bring in technology, we can do things faster with fewer mistakes. So efficiency increases as we go higher up this pyramid. As we lay down technology, we get the value of efficiency faster, uh, doing things faster with fewer mistakes. But the cost of change also increases. It is much easier to change a paper-based process. We can throw it away and start again within a day. However, it can take years to change a software-based process. And we know this. We know we've seen multiple things in the news of years and years of implementation by hundreds and hundreds, thousands sometimes of people. Um, so we need to start here. If technology is that costly to change, before we solidify any processes or beliefs, we need to ensure we solidify the right ones. And we saw in this client's case that we're solidifying the wrong process. Because if we instead trusted Star, the cost would naturally decrease. We wouldn't be checking their work. We wouldn't be hiring people to check their work. And we wouldn't be causing our staff to go elsewhere out of frustration. As my father puts it, managers can't see. Not because they don't want to, but because they're unquestionably following the rules without asking why. They're not questioning, can staff be trusted? We're in Victorian times. We're not. We weren't asking, is cholera really spread by, by inhaling bad smell? Right, so recap, let's bring all this together. Technology solidifies processes. If processes are based on incorrect beliefs, technology will only help us do the wrong thing better and make it harder to do the right thing later on because we would have solidified the wrong thing. We would have encased it in concrete. Um, here are some other invalidated beliefs uh, that I've learned the hard way. I've made mistakes. Um, not only can staff be trusted, we hide them after all, uh, but focusing on costs actually increased costs. Managers cannot motivate staff, but create conditions for staff to feel motivated. All these things. The so what? So an invalid belief is likely to mobilize unhelpful behaviors. Like Sheila, we need to make sure we're not missing. We don't have a missing because. Cause and effect thinking can help us find and upgrade those incorrect beliefs, the miasma theory, the don't trust your staff. Um, and technology solidifies processes and may mean we just do the wrong thing better, as we were tempted to do as a principal technology consultant, or at least as I was. Um, and therefore, transformation begins with understanding and transforming beliefs. The last thing we want to do is solidify the wrong thing. If I were to try and summarize this presentation in one quote, you know, I like my quotes. Akov says, the principal obstruction to an organization getting to where its managers most want it to be lies in the minds of its managers, the beliefs that we hold as managers. Staff cannot be trusted. Cholera is spread by inhaling bad smells. It's probably not a belief held nowadays, but. Um, and all these beliefs do is lead to the wrong behaviors, uh, the wrong processes, the wrong technology. They hold us back and stop us seeing the real reasons, the real things we need to tackle, the real things that we need to do. Now what? So if you want to read more, here are some books. Uh, all these books contribute to this presentation. The one on the left there, Sandra Hempel, is the book which really taught me a lot about cholera. And then all of the other ones are assumption busting books that help me realize the, the assumptions I held when trying to manage staff or deal with staff and organizations were woefully incorrect. Um, and this is where you can find me if you want to have a chat or just say hi. Um, but, uh, and also there's, yes, a compilation of uh, a free download there. Um, you don't need to give me your email address. You can just click download. PDF, a compilation of short articles that aims to help anyone better understand and uproot the source of organizational dysfunctions so happy staff can deliver better things to customers sooner. So more of the same if you find this thing interesting. But most of all, just thank you very much for having me. Um, and I hope this has been a useful uh, use of your time. Thank you very much.